Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome again to the fourth uh, in our series of five webinars on Building a Better Disciple. Uh, our topic tonight is Liturgy and Prayer, the Engine of Discipleship. Uh, we'll be talking about what liturgy and prayer means in the life of a disciple. Uh, as always, I want to start tonight with a short opening prayer. Uh, tonight we'll have a little opening prayer, a little reading from Scripture, some intercessions, uh, the Our Father, uh, and then... Uh, we'll close with a short blessing. So I invite you to get yourself comfortable, settle down somewhere, uh, and uh, we remind ourselves that wherever we are at, we are in God's presence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God of power and mercy, only with your help can we offer you fitting service and praise May we live the faith we profess and trust your promise of eternal life. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. In the same way, the Spirit too comes to the aid of our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought but the Spirit itself intercedes with inexpressible groanings. And the one who searches hearts knows what is the intention of the Spirit, because it intercedes for the holy ones according to God's will. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In our weakness, and knowing that it is God who prays through us, we offer these intercessions. Through your precious blood, Lord, you redeemed us from the slavery of sin. Grant us the freedom of the sons of God. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Bestow your grace upon our bishops, clergy, and all catechists. May they spread your gospel with joy and ardor. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Grant that all who seek the truth may find it, and in finding it, may they desire it all the more. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Be present to comfort widows, orphans, and all the abandoned, Lord. May they feel close to you and cling to you. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Receive our departed brethren into the heavens where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you will be all in all. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And we offer to God the prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. All right. Well, again, welcome. Uh, whether this is your fourth uh, time with us in this series or if this is your first, uh, my name is Jonathan Sullivan. I am the Director of Catechetical Services for the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois. Uh, it is my pleasure to be your host this evening and to uh, help us to have this uh, conversation and time together to, to talk about these important subjects. Uh, this has been a really fun series for me, I have to say. I've really enjoyed everyone's participation, and enjoyed, enjoy, I am enjoying seeing all the same names kind of pop up from week to week. So I, I'm very glad to see that all of you seem to be enjoying it and are, are following along as well. <laughs> A uh, few reminders about this series. Uh, if you've done any of my webinars in the past, those have been typically more informational delivery type webinars. Uh, this is a little bit different. This is a little more formational, uh, a little more uh, 
uh, spiritual in nature, so it's going to be a little more reflective and personal, uh, which means that there will be opportunities to respond. We want this to be a conversation as much as possible uh, as the technology allows. So uh, when those opportunities come up uh, and there's going to be questions on the screen, I invite you to open up your GoToMeeting control panel. Again, if that control panel closes on you, you can just open it up again by clicking on that little orange arrow button on your screen. That will open and close that control panel, and then you can click into the box uh, for questions, where it says enter a question for staff there, you click into that box and you'll be able to type in your responses and they will pop up on my screen and I can share them with everyone who's online tonight. Uh, again, as in the past, uh, to respect everyone's privacy, I'll only use first names uh, when reading those responses back. So uh, please, again, uh, when those opportunities arrive, uh, please do participate uh, in the questions. Uh, so as I said, this is the fourth in our series. Uh, in the previous weeks, we've talked about Jesus as the face of discipleship, as our model of discipleship, uh, as our uh, the person we're trying to emulate as we seek to become closer to God. Uh, we spent some time talking about scripture and tradition and the way that they guide us in our path of discipleship by showing us the boundary lines, as it were. Last week, we talked about Christian community and what it means to be part of a Christian community, whether that's our families or our parishes or the wider community, how we are called to be Christians, to be disciples in those different settings. Uh, tonight, we'll be discussing liturgy and prayer and how they help to energize us and prepare us to, to go into the world uh, to be disciples. And next week we'll focus on vocation and mission and see what it means to be a disciple and to claim our vocation and to know what, uh, how we share in the mission of the church when we go out into the world. So we'll begin. Uh, the first question we want to talk about tonight when it comes to liturgy and prayer, and I'll be taking those in reverse order, uh, we're going to look at prayer first, is just what is prayer? Uh, when we're talking about uh, this subject, you know, what, what do we mean when we're talking about prayer in the life of a disciple? And if you remember back when we talked about scripture and tradition, we talked about revelation and divine revelation, what that means. And, and the simple definition we gave of that is that revelation is God's self-revealing to us through the many, many ways that he does that, through creation, through natural law, through uh, sacred scripture and sacred tradition, that that revelation is God's self-revealing to us. So in many ways, prayer then is our means of responding to God's self-revelation. Uh, it's the way in which we interact with God. It's the way in which we give back to God what belongs to God. The way that we uh, give him praise and thanks and uh, the way in which we have that relationship with God. Uh, it's the primary way in which uh, we relate to God. And, and the interesting thing is there's all sorts of different examples of this throughout the Bible. Uh, starting in the Old Testament, when we look at some of the great stories of the Old Testament, uh, the way these, these ancient figures related to God and prayed to him. So Abraham and Sarah, through their submission to God's will, that they uh, take up all of their belongings and move into a strange land. Uh, later, Abraham sacrificed to God uh, as an example of a, a, a way he relates to God, the way he prays to God through sacrifice. Later on, we hear about Moses, who spoke to God face to face, uh, who perhaps out of all of the Old Testament figures had the most intimate relationship with God, uh, was actually able to see God face to face. And uh, the Old Testament talks about when Moses came down from the mountain, uh, his face would be glowing uh, because of his encounter that he, he had with God up on the mountain. Uh, with King David, we have his great songs of praise and the different psalms which are attributed to him. Uh, wonderful ways in which uh, the, the Jewish faith and, and later on now the Christian tradition has prayed uh, through that great book of psalms. Uh, Solomon and his request for wisdom. God said that he would give Solomon anything that he asked. Uh, Solomon's response, asking for wisdom, was his way of responding to God and, and praying to God. And later the prayers of the prophets for the conversion of Israel, uh, that they would... Uh, that the people would return back to their right relationship with God. Another example of strong prayer in the Old Testament. And certainly in the New Testament, we have many examples of prayer. Uh, Mary Magnificat, uh, giving praise and glory to God. Uh, and then Jesus, of course, himself, who is often depicted as going and praying, uh, often going off by himself to pray, having, again, a very intimate one-on-one uh, -on -one relationship with God the Father. Uh, but even in his day-to-day -day life, Jesus 
participated in worship in the synagogues. He went to the temple and prayed. Um, you know, was engaged in the faith life of the Jewish people in which he was raised at the time. And then for his disciples, uh, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, especially for their own conversion of heart. Uh, and if we look at the kind of preeminent prayer uh, that Jesus taught his disciples, the Our Father, uh, it's in very much, uh, in many ways, a, a prayer of conversion, a praying, uh, asking God to change our hearts, to give us what we need, and to conform our own wills to God's will. You know, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Asking that we have the, the wisdom, the knowledge, and often the patience uh, to see God's will done rather than our own. And then Jesus hears and answers many prayers uh, in the New Testament of people who approached him, especially those asking for healing. Uh, you know, many, many stories in the New Testament where people come and ask Jesus to heal them, and he responds. He doesn't turn them away. He doesn't uh, belittle them. He responds to those prayers that are brought before him. Brought, he responds to those requests uh, that are brought to him in the people that he encounters in his life in the New Testament. So I want to talk a little bit then about the different types of prayer uh, that the church has set before us, different uh, typologies of prayer, uh, especially in different forms and expressions. And when you, we look, especially in the catechism, these are laid out very clearly as the different uh, categories in which we can put prayer into. And so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in this first part of our webinar tonight. Uh, so first, the forms of prayer. Now, there's five uh, kind of... Uh, typical forms of prayer which the church has identified for us. The first is blessing and adoration. And the Catechism describes these as the first stances of prayer. That the first type of prayer we're to learn, the first type of prayer we are to give to God in our lives is blessing and adoration. That we adore God as our creator um, because of all that he has given for us uh, just by the very fact of our being. Uh, he is above us and, and greater than us, and so we, we adore God and we bless God. And, and what that means, that's a strange strange phrase, uh, to, to bless God. When we say that we bless God, uh, how could human beings ever bless God who has given us everything? And that's exactly what it is. It's an acknowledgement that God has blessed us with everything, and so we return those blessings to God. That's what we mean when we say that we bless God. Uh, the Catechism puts it this way, because God blesses, the human heart can in return bless the one who is the source of every blessing. So it's only because we have been blessed by God that we can in turn say, God, you are blessed, we bless you. Uh, it's an acknowledgement of those blessings we have been given. So blessing and adoration, that first stance of prayer, the first attitude we should have when approaching God in prayer, adoring God as creator, as uh, the very ground of our being, as it were. The second form of prayer, then, is petition. And this is one I think we're all <laughs> very familiar with, uh, in which we recognize that all that we have is a gift from God. And so uh, we seek to ask God for the things that we need in our lives. Uh, we do that in humility, especially, first of all, by acknowledging our own sinful nature and acknowledging that we are unworthy to even ask God for anything, and yet God permits us to do so. God uh, grants us the grace to ask of him the things that we need in our lives. And so we, we start in humility and uh, in asking God for things. But in all that, we always ask that it's God will, God's will that is done, so that any goods that we are given are done for the purpose of building up the kingdom of uh, doing good in the world. So petition, and then very closely related to that, intercession. So petition is when we ask for things for ourselves. Uh, intercession is when we ask for the good of another, um, when we intercede on behalf of another and ask God to give others the good things that they need in their lives. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, again, this is a, another type of prayer that we're very, very familiar with, whether it's asking for healing for a loved one or uh, now, of course, in this month of November, ask, uh, praying for the repose of the souls of our loved ones. You know, interceding on their behalf, the, the souls in purgatory, uh, whether it's asking for uh, safe travels for someone we may know. Uh, you know we intercede and, and ask God to give people the good things that they need in their lives. And often that's in response to their request of us. You know, We ask others to intercede for us. Uh, it's not that just we bring our own petitions to God, but we ask others to bring our petitions to intercede on our behalf. So uh, a wonderful example of, again, 
going back to last week, living in Christian community, supporting one another, uh, and praying for one another at all times. The fourth form of prayer is thanksgiving. Uh, again, going back to God as the giver of all great gifts uh, and acknowledging that God is the giver. Uh, and so thanking him for the gifts he's given us when he answers those petitions, when he answers those intercessions, we give thanks for those things. Uh, even when the answer may not be exactly what we uh, would have wanted of God, uh, we know that God answers all prayer. And so even when God answers in ways that may surprise us or uh, we may not have expected, you know, we still we give thanks that God has answered those prayers, even if it's in ways uh, that uh, we wouldn't have expected. And the preeminent form of, of that Thanksgiving prayer is the Eucharist. Eucharist, the word itself, means thanksgiving. And so we come together at the Eucharist to, to thank God and praise God uh, for everything that he has given. And, and that's certainly a theme uh, when you listen to the prayers of the Mass, uh, a theme that comes back again and again, thanking God uh, for the gifts he's given us. And then finally, that last form of prayer, praise. Uh, praising God simply because he is. Uh, it, it's not just praising God for what he's given us. That's thanksgiving. But praising God just for being God. Uh, again, the Catechism puts it this way. Praise is the form of prayer which recognizes most immediately that God is God. It lauds God for his own sake and gives him glory quite beyond what he does, but simply because he is. So just in the enormity of knowing that God is God, we praise God uh, and uh, give him the glory that is due to him because he is so far above us uh, and so worthy of that praise. So if those are the prayer, as the Catechism calls them, uh, then we also need to be attentive to the expressions of prayer, the way that we express our relationship with God, uh, the way we express our prayer. Uh, is another important component and, and uh, something that I think could be very personal for each of us, you know, finding the different expressions of prayer and the different forms of prayer that speak to us in particular in the ways that we find comfortable. And so there's three expressions of prayer. The first is vocal. And the Catechism calls this one an essential element of the Christian life. Vocalizing our prayers, praying out loud. Uh, because, most of all, because we need to do that as human persons. Because we are more than just spirit. We are spirit and body. Uh, ideally, prayer should involve the human senses. And so by vocalizing our prayer, by praying out loud, so that we can hear our own voice, so others can hear our voice. It helps us to engage those senses in our life of prayer. It's also important because this is the prayer that's usually most accessible to groups. It's very easy if you're just by yourself just to pray in an interior fashion. But we come together as groups. Um, we want to pray together. We pray as a community. And so we need to be attentive to what the prayer is, not just to our own interior prayer, but to the prayer of the community. And praying out loud helps us to do that. It helps us to recognize what is it we are coming together to pray for. helps to guide and to uh, give some structure to that prayer. And again, when we think about, we'll talk about this in a little bit, the liturgical prayer of the church. Uh, we pray out loud when we do that. We come together and pray out loud, vocalize our prayer, in order to pray well as a community. Uh, and and But not just always as uh, informal types of uh, rote prayer that we all have memorized. Uh, but I think a skill, especially as Catholics, we don't always appreciate, but which I think all Christians should practice, is that expository prayer. Being able to pray just off the top of our heads, without any uh, memorized prayers, but just praying from the heart, as it were. Uh, and that's something I think we as Catholics aren't always comfortable with. I recall uh, when I was in college, I went to, and visited my uh, then fiancés, now wife's family for Thanksgiving, and uh, knowing that I was a, a theology major, they asked me to pray before the Thanksgiving meal. Uh, this was a family of mostly Methodists. And knowing that, knowing that you know they may not know or be familiar with the, the Catholic uh, blessing of a meal, uh, I just did an expository prayer and just kind of prayed off the top of my head. And, and afterwards, my wife's aunt came over to me, and, and she knew I was Catholic, and she, and she kind of nudged me in the ribs and said, I didn't know Catholics could pray like that. Uh, and the truth is, we don't often pray like that. But like I said, I think it's a skill that we should practice. Uh, because there are so many times in our lives, so many situations that arise, when we may not have a memorized prayer that's appropriate, but we need to be able to just pray from the heart. Uh, so one model which I might uh, 
recommend to you, and you can Google for this, and there's a number of different resources out there, uh, kind of a simple structure for expository prayer uh, is called the You Who Do Through model. And it's just a four-part prayer model uh, that if you just memorize this basic pattern uh, will help you to be able to come up with prayer off the top of your head. And so it's, it's you, meaning first we name God, and so it may be, you know, God, all merciful Father, or uh, great creator. You know, we just, we, we attach a title or a name for God at the very beginning. So that's you. Then who? And this is naming something <clears throat> that God has done in the past that might be connected to what we're, we're going to be praying for. So often pulling something out of scripture is a great thing to do here. You know, so uh, you who fed the Israelites in the desert with manna and, and quail. You know, naming something God has done in the past. So you who then do, and this is where you're asking God uh, to do something now at this particular time. Uh, and then through, we always end all of our prayer with uh, either a Christological or a Trinitarian ending. So we ask this through Christ our Lord, or we ask this through Christ who reigns with the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Uh, you know, those, those very uh, rote kind of endings that we have in our prayers. So a, a simple one, uh, an expository prayer for uh, before a meal or something might go something like, uh, all gracious and sustaining God, you fed your people in the desert with manna and quail. We ask you to bless this meal before us today that it may nourish us in mind and body. And we ask you to look especially on those who will go without today that they may have their every need met. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. So again, just a very simple outline, a very simple structure that you can attach uh, your expository prayer to you who do through. And again, like I said, you can Google that phrase and uh, there's different resources out there that will give you kind of that basic outline and, and walk you through it. But uh, something that, like I said, I think all of us, especially as Catholics, because it's not something we're used to, uh, should practice and try out. So the next time you have an opportunity to start a meeting or a class or something with prayer, uh, you know, just, just try it out. Uh, and see if it will work for you. Like it's, it's, I, I think it's really something that we should be uh, practicing in our lives. So the first question I want to throw out uh, for some response tonight is, what forms or expressions of personal prayer, uh, you know what, I just realized I, I was just doing vocal there and I didn't even uh, get to the other two. My apologies. <laughs> uh, I was so focused on the vocal, I didn't focus on anything else. So the other two expressions of prayer then, uh, meditative prayer, which seeks God through attentiveness to some object or, or thing, often a word or an image uh, that we meditate upon. Uh, good examples of this are praying with icons, focusing on an icon and praying through an icon. It gives us focus our attention on uh, something that we can reflect on and meditate on. Uh, in that picture before us of a saint or a scripture story. Uh, the, the Jesuit imaginative prayer uh, is a form of prayer that the Jesuits use quite a bit in which you think of usually a, a scripture story and try to place yourself into the story and decide you know, if you're in the crowd with Jesus or if you're uh, listening to a prophet proclaim something to the people. You try to put yourself into the story and really try to imagine what that scene is like and what you're smelling and seeing and feeling and hearing, uh, how you're relating to other people. Uh, so that, that's another form of meditative prayer. Uh, the rosary is an excellent example, meditating on the mysteries of the rosary uh, as we say the Hail Marys and, and really reflecting on and meditating on those stories of the life of Jesus. And Lectio Divina, uh, which is a, a form of prayer, if you're not familiar with, I, I really encourage you to become familiar with uh, both, uh, well, recent popes, I'd say from, from John Paul II on, have really encouraged the faithful to be engaged in, in Lectio Divina, this deep meditation on scripture, you know, reading scripture multiple times and finding words and phrases that we can reflect on and, and listen for God's call in our life. Uh, so uh, it's another example of meditative prayer, using something, a story, a word, an image, uh, as the focus of our prayer and meditating on that and what it means for our lives. And then finally, contemplative prayer, the final expression of prayer. Uh, St. Teresa of Avila said, Contemplative prayer, in my opinion, is nothing else than a close sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. Catechism calls this uh, simply being with God, sitting in the presence of God, not necessarily even using words or uh, focusing on anything in particular, but just 
simply seeking to abide in God. Uh, there's kind of a, a mystical quality to this type of prayer. Uh, it's, it's intense. It often involves deep silence, but at the same time, a deep listening to God and a real seeking of union with God. Uh, a story uh, I may be apocryphal, I don't know, but I've heard from another number of different sources uh, of, a, of an older gentleman who would often be seen going into a church and just sitting in the pew and just staring at the tabernacle. Uh, and at some point, someone asked him, you know, when, when you go in and, and pray like that, what are you doing? Uh, and the older gentleman just pointed to the tabernacle and said, I look at him and he looks at me. You know, that's contemplative prayer, just being, just abiding with God. Uh, probably the most difficult of the expressions of prayer. Uh, not one that I think a lot of people find accessible because it, it requires such, such patience and practice and uh, just being in a quiet place, which is very, very difficult uh, in our particular time and place uh, in this, this modern century. Uh, so now, uh, going to our, our question, uh, what forms or expressions of personal prayer have you found most engaging? Uh, what have you found helpful in terms of the, the different forms and expressions? Uh, and maybe which do you struggle with? You know, which have you uh, found it difficult to practice? Which have you tried and it just haven't, hasn't spoken to you for whatever reason? So open up your GoToMeeting control panel. Again, click on that little orange arrow button if it's closed on you. And then click down into that uh, question box down there and you can type your response there. I'll tell you for me, the one I struggle with the most is definitely uh, the, the contemplative. Um, I just don't have a lot of time to, to, to practice it, to try it. Uh, when you've got six little kids running around at home, I'm, I'm lucky to get you know, 15 minutes of good prayer in, in the morning. Uh, so, you know, I definitely need uh, the meditative types of prayer, something where I have something I can really focus on. Vocal prayer I find very, very helpful just because it, it, I have to hear myself pray in order to, to pray well sometimes just because there's so much else uh, going on around me. Um, so some of the responses coming in. Uh, Nicole says, vocal and meditative uh, have been helpful to her. Uh, Liz says, most engaging for me is Visio Divina, uh, especially using the illustrations of St. the St. John's Bible. Yeah, another good example uh, of using an image. And if, if you are not familiar with the St. John's Bible, Google it. Uh, it was a, an illustrated Bible that was commissioned a few years back, and just a gorgeous piece of art. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure if there's any uh, anything near our diocese, but I know some places have bought really nice copies of this and actually uh, send it around their dioceses and, and kind of tour it just to allow people to, to look and, and pray with it and, and see it. So uh, absolutely, a Visio Divina, kind of a, another take on Lexio Divina. Uh, Meg says, I love meditative and contemplative, struggle the most with vocal. Interesting. Uh, D. Gray says Lexio Divina has been very, very good uh, for her. Thank you, D. Uh, Jane says, I find that I am most comfortable with the meditative form of prayer, especially the rosary. Uh, I think a, a lot of people would uh, agree with that. Lana says contemplative. Uh, so interesting. Uh, quite a few people, it looks like, enjoy com contemplative. Tamara says, I really enjoy contemplative. I get to Mass on Sunday evening, an hour and a half before it starts. It's only an hour a week, but that quiet in the presence of God is rewarding. Yeah, I hope to be able to, to get that uh, in my own life at some point. Uh, Margaret says, I use all of them, and I struggle with all. <laughs> I think we all have that experience from time to time, where uh, uh, none of them seem perfect, and none of them seem like they're really getting us to our ultimate goal. Liz says, uh, most struggle with is the rosary. As a convert, it wasn't a practice for me, and it's difficult for me to meditate while trying to focus on the prayers. Yeah, I think that's one that a lot of converts sometimes uh, wonder about and question about, uh, and it takes them a while to, to get into it. Uh, Meredith says, vocal and meditative are my most preferred. Lawson says, I don't feel like I understand the difference between meditative and contemplative. Is contemplative vocal without words? Uh, that's not a bad way to consider it. Uh, but the real, I think the real difference is the meditative has something that you're, 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 you're focusing on. It, you have something that you're using as an entrance into prayer. Again, whether it's a, a Bible story or an image or, or something. Whereas the contemplative is just being and, and just allowing God to, 
to be there with you and to be in the presence of God. There's no real entrance. And so I, you often hear that contemplative is difficult for a lot of people because there's nothing to focus on and our mind wanders. It, it's almost... I think part of the difficulty in, in the terminology is we're so used to meditative in terms of the Eastern sense of meditation, uh, which is really much you know trying to quiet the mind, trying to uh, get rid of thought, which in our, the Christian tradition is what we'd call more contemplative. So if, if you're thinking Eastern meditation, that's much more analogous to uh, Christian con- contemplation than it is to Christian meditation. So that, that may be one difference uh, with the terminology. Kristen says, definitely struggle with contemplative prayer. I need to focus on something specific. Yeah, uh, always helpful. Michelle says, I enjoy the rosary at bedtime when everyone else is asleep. I also like visual prayer, using art as a medium. I've even taught my students to use this. Contemplative is the hardest for me. Uh, Barbara says, contemplative is the most engaging. I struggle mostly with liturgy of the hours. Yeah, we're going to talk about liturgy of the hours uh, in just a little bit. Denise says, um, Meditative is the one she engages with the most. She struggles with contemplative. Tracy says, vocal is most helpful to me. I find myself carrying on a conversation with God. Yeah, I think that's also very, uh, 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 that a lot of people would say that, that they find vocal easy because it it becomes almost conversational uh, where we're we're proposing something to God, asking God for things, uh, giving God thanks, and then you know, listening for that response. Christine says, one of the most difficult for me, yet also the best, is the contemplative. It is so hard to be quiet and listen, even more difficult when God doesn't say what I want to hear. However, this is the prayer where I feel closest to God. Yeah, and I think that's really the goal of contemplation, is that that closeness to God, where we're not putting up uh, barriers, whether that's, you know, the, the words or the whatever we're focusing on, but just allowing God to be Michelle says, vocal prayer, by far best suited for myself. Meditative works for me as well, but not contemplative. Uh, Jane says, the most difficult type of prayer for me is, as you mentioned, the expository prayer. My first expository prayer was at the beginning of a faculty meeting when the principal called upon me to start with a prayer. Yikes! I had never done it before, but it turned out okay. (laughs) Good, I'm glad to hear that. Vicky says, prayer of any form and expression helps me in daily life. I find contemplative most moving for me. The problem with contemplative is finding the time for it right now. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I was giving a, I was at a conference this afternoon. I was giving a breakout session on uh, young people and uh, digital technology and how we reach young people, uh, evangelize and catechize them through the new media. And one of the things I pointed out is, because young people are so inundated with noise and messages and media uh, that finding ways for them to be quiet, finding ways for them to, to have some time for contemplation is really important uh, as they're going to progress through the uh, their Christian journey. And so uh, it's interesting. The recent popes have really encouraged young people to find time for quiet. And it's amazing. I, I never would have guessed this. But when we find that kind of quiet time for our young people, they tend to respond very, very well. Uh, I would think that it would be very hard for them, that it would be difficult that they'd want distractions and, and be looking for that kind of sensory input. And yet, time and again, whenever I see young people uh, engaged in quiet pr- prayer, they respond very, very well to it. That's interesting. Uh, D says, those struggling with the rosary might try the scriptural rosary. That can be a, a very good... Uh, a method of praying the rosary, yeah. Chris says, I do the best with meditative prayer. Lawson says, then is contemplative like a wandering little talk in your mind? Um, maybe, not necessarily. It's, it's really, a, it is about kind of clearing the mind and, uh, you know, just allowing God to enter in. And, and I think that can look different for different people. Sometimes it's going to be a little more visual. Sometimes it may be more uh, words in your mind. Uh, it's kind of hard, it, especially when you look at the lives of the saints. Uh, that kind of contemplative prayer takes many, many different forms. Uh, it's often where many of the saints will tend to have their mystical visions. Isn't that kind of contemplative prayer when they've just uh, cleared away all the distractions and just allow God to be there? Uh, Maria says, I find contemplative the most spiritual type of prayer. Very good. 
Well, thank you. So you can see, just within this small group here, we have a, a wide variety of people who find different types of prayer, uh, different forms, different expressions most helpful for them. So I think that's one of the great gifts that God has given us when it comes to personal prayer, that uh, we're not just stuck in um, one time, uh, one type of prayer, but we're, we're given different types of prayer so that we as individuals uh, can find the type of prayer that's best going to work for us and best communicate uh, to God for us. Uh, I've gotten a couple of notes from folks that are saying uh, that the sound isn't uh, is kind of cutting in and out. I apologize for that. Uh, I'm not in my normal setting tonight. I'm actually uh, at my in-laws' house tonight because uh, uh, I was visiting them uh, doing that workshop this afternoon. So uh, I apologize if the the internet connection isn't. Uh, as great as I would hope for it to be, but hopefully the, the recording will come out if you need to go back and listen to some sections. So I apologize if, if you're not getting great audio tonight. All right, I want to take just a quick moment to talk a little bit uh, about prayer and human development. Uh, yeah, as I was just kind of alluding to, uh, different people find different types of prayer, uh, the different forms, the different expressions helpful. But that changes over time as well. Uh, how we pray is going to change as we grow and deepen our relationship, as we become older. Uh, not because God changes. Our, our type of prayer doesn't change because God changes. Uh, but because we do. We mature. Uh, we grow older. We uh, gain more experience. We get more education. Uh, we find ourselves in new situations in our lives, whether that's uh, taking on a new vocation, if we get uh, get married or enter into religious life or the priesthood, uh, we find we take on new jobs, move to new cities. Uh, you know, all of these things are going to change the way that we approach God uh, because we're changing. Uh, for instance, you know, how I pray as a husband and as a father differs significantly from how I prayed when I was single. I have different worries, I have different concerns, I have different needs that I'm asking God for. Uh, now in this season of my life than when I was younger. And so knowing these different forms and these different expressions can help us when we find that one type of prayer just doesn't work for us anymore. Uh, we need to then branch out and experiment, try other forms of prayer to see what's going to work. And this actually hit me uh, very, very close to home. Uh, after I finished with my graduate studies, uh, I had the great fortune of, of doing my graduate studies at a, a Dominican school and the, the order of preachers, if you're if you're familiar at all with them, have a long tradition of study as prayer, and to the point now where uh, I know at least with the, the Dominican friars, they still have as a rule uh, that a student brother is allowed to miss communal prayer with the community if they're engaged in study. Uh, study is that important to the life of the Dominicans and, and that much a part of their spirituality, and. Conscious or not, as I was studying with them, I really took that on for myself so that it was in my studies that I was doing my, my, my uh, most regular prayer. And so when I finished my graduate studies and I was no longer regularly engaged in and all of this, I suddenly found that my prayer life had just dried up. And it was probably dry for probably a good year and a half or so. Uh, before I was able to really get back into a more regular routine of prayer. And, and much to my own surprise, uh, what really helped me to get back into a, uh, a more rich and fruitful prayer life was going back to the basics. Uh, and it was really starting with the rosary and, and getting back into a practice of saying the rosary on a regular basis. And, and the truth is, I, I'm, I don't particularly enjoy the rosary. I don't typically find it a, a particularly fruitful type of prayer for me. Uh, not that I, I think it's a bad or anything. It's a great part of our tradition, but it's just not something that ever really spoke to me. And yet here I found myself at the end of my graduate studies uh, entering more and more deeply into the rosary just because having those rote words and having the form set for me uh, meant I didn't have to think about it as much. You know, I didn't have to come up with my own prayer. But having that type of prayer just really helped me to uh, get back into a regular uh, a, a regular prayer life. Uh, so you never know what's going to be helpful for you at any particular season in your life. Uh, you know, this is part of the reason why lifelong adult formation is so integral to Christian life. We can't be content to relate to God you know, as an eighth grader our entire lives. We're going to mature, we're going to get older, and so we need to 
find different ways to approach God in different seasons, because the mystery of God is never exhausted. We're never going to plumb, plumb its depths, its depths. And so as we're, we're entering more and more into God, we need to find ways that are going to help us to go deeper, uh, because that relationship is never exhausted either. So for our next question, how has your prayer life changed over time? Uh, what is it that you have found helpful in different seasons in your life, and how has that changed? Uh, you know, what what did you do when you were younger for prayer that that uh, you know you don't find as helpful now, uh, or what do you do now that surprises you that you find helpful that you never would have guessed uh, was helpful? Just as I found the rosary suddenly in, in a season of my life particularly helpful. Uh, so open up your go to meeting control panel uh, and click into that question box. And you can type your answer in there about how has your prayer life changed over time. And Maria says, I am more comfortable with the silence required to hear God. Yeah, I, I wonder if that contemplative, silent kind of prayer, uh, if the older we get, if that doesn't become uh, easier for us and more important to us as we seek to listen to God. Uh, as I say, I look forward to the time in my life when I'm able to do that a little bit more, uh, when I don't have quite as many distractions and uh, obligations to take care of in my life. Uh, Nicole says, I really began to pray more when I was going through my divorce. I find myself praying constantly throughout the day. Yeah, certainly in those seasons where we're going through rough patches and there's turbulence in our life, uh, learning to rely on God and learning to ask God for the things we need to get us through uh, just that that day to day uh, uh, struggles that we go through uh, absolutely important, and I think too often uh, that 's when it 's in those seasons where people tend to not pray as much as they should because they 're going through so much and they think oh you know i don 't have the energy i don 't have the time for prayer uh, but I think yeah it 's in those times when we really need to refocus our prayer. Barbara says, I used to journal more when I was younger i don 't feel that need much anymore as I used to. Yeah, that's another, you know, it, it's a type of vocal prayer, that, that kind of journaling prayer where we're, we're putting words on paper. I may not be saying the words out loud necessarily, but it's, it's, it's giving expression to our, our words and our longings. Uh, I know a number of people who uh, regularly journal, my own wife actually, uh, not every day, but uh, you know, pretty frequently, if, if not weekly, uh, uh, not much less than that, uh, will often be writing down prayers and thoughts to God in, in her journal. Lawson says, since I came through RCIA, it has changed from the vocal, easily done, to the being. I still struggle sometimes with the rote prayers, although I love the, the community of it. I guess the answer is it's opened up to more than what it was, which is really the goal of, of the praying life, is to seek to deepen and open it up more. Uh, Catherine says, a combination of both spontaneous and rote works well. Tamara says... I find that I'm able to pray more often during the day, staying in touch with Jesus. I also think that attending morning Mass has helped me with my focus each day. I really miss it when I don't get to go. Jane says, when I was younger, I would pray during set times. Now I pray whenever I have a moment that I'm not doing anything else. Driving time is a prime time to pray. Helps avoid road rage, for one thing. You can't get mad if you're praying. Yeah, I think a lot of people find that a very helpful time. I, uh, when I was growing up, my mom had about a 40-minute one-way commute, and uh, the rosary was off for morning prayer on her way into work. Lana says, I find that the older I get, the more I enjoy sitting quietly with the Lord. I enjoy sitting in his presence and listening to what he has to say to me rather than what I have to say. Yeah. Uh, Margaret says, some spiritual books draw me into prayer. Yeah, again, that, that study or that reading is prayer. Uh, lots of great uh, material in that. Uh, Meredith says, I have always talked to God as though he was there next to me. Still today, I pray out loud, and so do my children. <laughs> Roxanne says, my prayer life has changed over time by truly understanding the meaning of prayers, such as the rosary, the novenas and praying to the saints, also praying more throughout the day and night. Michelle says, I had no real prayer life until I had children, and in particular when the health of one of my children was seriously threatened. Vocal prayer is what enables me to stay focused, though oddly I struggle with the rosary. My best prayer is often done during commutes to work, and thus is struggling severely now that I am not working. 
Yeah, again, that's a good example of how our life situation can affect our prayer life. When uh, we've gotten used to praying on the way to work, and when we retire, or uh, for whatever reason, are no longer working, suddenly we need to, to find new uh, spaces in our lives so that we can con- continue uh, to pray well. Christine says, uh, as I get older and meet so many people who are struggling with issues and uh, health problems, I have found that when I do the vocal prayer, I include many more intercessions. That becomes a majority of my prayer. Liz says, adoration has become much more meaningful to me than I ever expected. Additionally, I find myself singing and praying in my head throughout the day. Yeah, Sometimes having one of those hymns stuck in your, your head can be a wonderful way of uh, praying throughout the day. Nancy says, I no longer feel guilty about not being fond of praying the rosary, and that has made me feel free to pray however I feel that day. Love to read and pray. Yeah, sometimes we have that, uh, I, I won't go so far as to call it Catholic guilt, uh, but sometimes we feel like, you know, we wish we could pray one way, uh, and yet it just doesn't work for us. And so we need to be free to experiment and try different types of prayer. Uh, Jane says, ah, somebody mentioned praying to the saints. That is something I have started recently also, as I try to expose my 8th grade students to various sorts of Catholic prayers. Yeah, again, asking the saints for intercession, asking them to intercede for us. Uh, A a great type of prayer, especially when you have uh, specific needs and can take them before specific saints who uh, may have a particular uh, patronage or charism for those types of prayers. So good. So again, we can see, again, even in our small group here, lots of different ways in which our prayer lives have changed over time, how our lives have affected the way we pray, and we've had to find new ways to incorporate prayer in our life and new ways of expressing prayer in our lives, depending on where we're at. Excellent. So we've spent the first part of this webinar talking about prayer, and particularly personal prayer. Uh, And personal prayer is absolutely important uh, because it's about our relationship with God. But for Catholics especially, uh, and we're by no means uh, unique in this way, uh, liturgy is one of the important ways in which we enter into prayer. uh, Differently than uh, personal prayer, because personal prayer is just about the individual, while liturgy is about coming together as a community and praying. It's about praying as church together. Uh, Liturgy literally means work of the people. Uh, It was actually a a word that was used to describe public works projects in the ancient world. So liturgy is the work of the people. Uh, It's something that we do together as a community. Uh, And something which we are not just expected to do, but which we have uh, a right and an obligation to do. In the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy from the Second Vatican Council, Uh, The Council Fathers said that participation in the liturgy by the Christian people as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, is their right and duty by reason of their baptism. Because of our baptism, we are called to enter into liturgical prayer. Uh, It's what Christians do. It's part of what um, we as the people of God come together to do on a regular basis. And so... Because of our baptism, we've, we've been graced by God to be able to do that. Now, liturgy has a number of uh, unique qualities to it that differentiate it from personal prayer. So I'm going to use a couple of examples uh, uh, to talk about what we mean by that. Uh, probably the preeminent example of the liturgy is the Mass. It's the liturgical prayer which all of us are probably most familiar with, uh, especially Sunday Mass, because Sunday Mass... Uh, is the day in which we come together to worship. It's the, the Christian day of worship, the Lord's Day, the day in which we recall the resurrection. Uh, it's, sometimes you may hear the phrase that uh, every Sunday is a little Easter. That's actually backwards. Uh, Easter is actually a big Sunday. Sunday is our primary day of uh, worship and celebration of God. And we just do that in a really big way on Easter. Uh, we celebrate in a particular way the Lord's resurrection. But Sunday Mass is important because it recalls the resurrection, because it fulfills Christ's request that we do this in memory of me. So coming together, celebrating, breaking the bread, sharing the wine, uh, the body and blood of Christ, uh, it's what Christ has asked us to do. And that's one of the reasons why the Eucharist is so special uh, to the Christian community. 
So the Mass is an ex example of liturgical prayer. Um, and one of the characteristics of liturgical prayer is there's a set text. And so on the screen you can see this is um, you know, one of the pages out of the Roman Missal, the, the book in which we find all the prayers of the Mass. Uh, we have a set text. We don't just get to make it up as we go along. Uh, there are some Christian traditions that do that, that have no set liturgy, that every time they come together on Sunday you have no idea what uh, is going to be happening as part of the worship service. Uh, you just kind of show up and... Uh, either they give you something to follow along with, or you just kind of caught up with it and go. Uh, but that's not the, the tradition of uh, the ancient church, not the tradition uh, that, that we have followed. And I think there's some advantages to having that kind of set text. Uh, for one, it allows us to practice our prayer as a community. Uh, liturgy gets easier the more you participate, the more you practice it. Uh, liturgy to be done well requires some thought and some effort. Uh, it's not something that we usually just get right on the first time. And so by entering into it repeatedly, by listening to the same prayers over and over, by hearing the same readings over the course of three years, we become more familiar with them. It allows us to enter into that participation and practice it so that we can get better with it over the course of our lives. Uh, it, it also connects us with the early church. Uh, one of our Eucharistic prayers that we use in the Mass actually dates to the 3rd century. Uh, it's not just something that was made up in modern times, but goes back to some of the earliest years of the church. Uh, and, and literally, if, if you read that ancient Eucharistic prayer uh, and were to follow along, you would recognize very clearly the language we use in Mass, uh, right down to the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Um, the ancient church was praying in that way, uh, and we have continued that tradition down to, to, to today. And finally, there's an advantage because you can go to any Catholic church in the world, and even if you don't know the language, you can still follow along. You can still recognize the contours and the shape uh, and the actions that are going on in the Mass. So uh, it helps to connect us to the universal church. Uh, not just to the ancient church, but to the church around the world today, uh, helps us to know that whatever's going on uh, in a Mass, we can follow along because we're familiar with the form. We know what's what's going to be taking place. Uh, on the screen, uh, you'll also see um, these liturgical texts uh, use both red and black ink. Now, the red ink are called the rubrics, uh, and that comes from a word that means red. Uh, and it just, the red is just, what is done in the Mass. It's the instructions. Uh, the black is what we, is actually said out loud by uh, the people, by the, the presider, uh, and so on. So the, the red text just tells you what to do, and the, the black text tells you what to say. So, uh, and that's true for all liturgical texts. In fact, uh, on this next screen here, I have a page out of the Liturgy of the Hours, uh, which is another uh, one of the great types of liturgical prayer. And again, you can see the red and the black text, the red uh, telling you the different parts, and then the black tells you what to actually pray. Uh, the Liturgy of the Hours is, is a wonderful prayer type, and one which the Second Vatican Council really encouraged all people to pray. Uh, the Second Vatican Council described it as the prayer of the church. Uh, it's required by clergy uh, to pray it every day, and many religious congregations come together to pray it regularly. Uh, Uh, but strongly encouraged for all of the faithful to pray the Liturgy of the Hours because it helps us to consecrate our entire day to God uh, by praying at regular intervals. So most importantly in that is morning prayer and evening prayer. Those are the two principal hours of the Liturgy of the Hours uh, in which we're called to come together first in the morning to prepare ourselves, to give thanks to God, to, to celebrate uh, the resurrection uh, is often a major theme in morning prayer as we give our day to God, and then in the evening coming and giving thanks to God for all the great gifts he's given us over the course of the day. So uh, that's the Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, yeah, And there's a number of different ways you can enter in the Liturgy of the Hours without actually using the formal text. There's a lot of good prayer aids out there uh, that will have very simple morning prayer and evening prayer that you can pray uh, different resources out there, and, and you can talk to your your pastor, or uh, if you want some ideas of what some of those are, drop me a line. I'd be happy to send you some links to those. So liturgy then is a number of things. It's it's an a an expression of Christian community for one, uh, because it is communal prayer. Uh, liturgy is never celebrated alone. Uh, liturgy is always celebrated in the context of a community. 
um, to the point where even when you find in the instructions of the Mass, it always says uh, Mass should always be celebrated with at least one other person. It, it should be a very rare Mass that's just the priest by himself. Uh, but the expectation is that there's at least one other person in the room when Mass is being said. And even for the Liturgy of the Hours, when someone's saying the Liturgy of the Hours just on their own, it's always understood that, that is part of the entire church praying, that we always pray with the church, even when we're praying the Liturgy of the Hours on our own. Uh, so we gather to, to pray together the liturgy as, as local communities uh, and parishes and, and religious congregations and across time with the saints. Uh, whenever we enter into liturgical prayer, we are praying with the saints because the saints uh, in, in heaven are always praying and always um, giving praise to God, which is why in the Mass, you know, we, we hear uh, before the Holy, 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 you know, with the angels and the saints, we give you praise and, and pray with them. You know, that's often part of the entrance into the Holy, Holy, Holy is uh, we are praying with the angels and with the saints in their hymn of praise. We're entering into that in our liturgical prayer. Second, the liturgy is an entrance into the Paschal mystery. Uh, and again, this is something that was really uh, re-emphasized at the Second Vatican Council, that uh, liturgical prayer is one way in which we celebrate and remind ourselves and enter into and experience the Paschal mystery. Uh, the Council Fathers, again, in the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy said, the Church has never failed to come together to celebrate the Paschal mystery, reading those things which were in all the scriptures concerning him, celebrating the Eucharist in which the victory and triumph of his death are again made present, and at the same time giving thanks to God for his unspeakable gift in Christ Jesus in praise of his glory through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we remind ourselves what God has done for us through the Paschal mystery, through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Uh, we remind ourselves that in, in the liturgy. So again, if you think about how we pray at Mass, we're reminding ourselves of Christ's sacrifice. And not just remembering it in a historical sense, but actually making it present now in the prayer of the Mass. Uh, so we, we enter into that through Christ's sacrifice, but also by bringing our own hopes, our own joys, our own sorrows and fears with us to Mass. Because... Christ took all of that on himself. And so when we bring those to, to prayer, when we bring those to the Mass, uh, Christ is accepting those and uh, using those as part of his own sacrifice. We, we can enter into and participate into Christ's sacrifice by bringing those things to the Mass. And then finally, liturgy is always expressed in and guided by the liturgical year. Uh, and this is another way in which we celebrate and are reminded of the Paschal Mysteries, is through the celebration of the liturgical year. Within the cycle of a year, uh, the Council Fathers tell us, the Church unfolds the whole mystery of Christ, from the Incarnation and Birth until the Ascension, the Day of Pentecost, and the expectation of Blessed Hope, and of the coming of the Lord. And so we do that in different ways. And I'm actually going to throw up here kind of a, a visual image of the liturgical year as we see the different cycle of seasons which the church goes through over the course of a different year. And the liturgical year is always expressed in a number of different ways in our liturgical prayer. Uh, through the prayers of the Mass, we hear different prayers in different liturgical seasons, uh, different opening prayers, different prayers after communion, so that uh, that opening prayer of the Mass during Advent is going to speak to Christ's coming, both his second coming and to his incarnation. Uh, in Lent, it's going to be much more of a penitential type of prayer, uh, reminding us of our need to participate in prayer and fasting and almsgiving. Um, also, we, the, the liturgical year is expressed through the lectionary cycle, through that cycle of readings that are proclaimed in the Mass, in the Liturgy of the Hours, and, and all the different types of uh, liturgical prayer uh, we always read something from Scripture, and so the, the liturgical year will help guide our reading of the Scriptures, so that, again, during Lent, we're going to be hearing about Jesus preparing for his final suffering. Uh, during Easter, we'll be hearing about the early church and their response to Christ's resurrection. Uh, and this includes Old and New Testament stories. Uh, the Old Testament is, is just as much a part of this as the New Testament. So uh, in Advent, we'll hear the, the prophecies of the coming of Christ as part of the Old Testament readings. Uh, again, the Liturgy of the Hours and the Office of Readings, which is a uh, part of the Liturgy of the Hours, we hear readings that speak to the different liturgical seasons, both readings from Scripture and readings from saints 
uh, and other important sources of the church. So uh, constantly being reminded of what season we're in and how that guides our prayer together. But this is really hard sometimes for us in a modern society to share this kind of understanding of sacred time, uh, putting aside kind of our secular calendar and, and thinking with and praying with the church's liturgical calendar. Uh, you know, that's hard in a society where Christmas decorations are on sale before Halloween. Uh, it can be hard to remind ourselves of what liturgical season we're in. Uh, our, our secular society always encourages us to look for the next big thing rather than being present right now in what we're celebrating. So that's something I've started to do, really encouraging people to uh, celebrate the liturgical season that we find ourselves in, uh, because it's a powerful way to enter into the Paschal Mystery, a powerful way to pray with the church. Uh, it's not always easy, but I think uh, it can really help us to uh, live our faith a little more deeply, live our faith in a public way, when we do things like not putting up Christmas decorations until a week before Christmas, you know, allowing Advent to be Advent and not just looking forward to Christmas Day. Uh, that's something my family has started doing, is we've, we've really started to uh, push back when we put up Christmas decorations, but then leaving Christmas decorations up for uh, as long uh, of the Christmas season as we can. Uh, another way we can do that is by keeping the octaves. Um, it's, you know, it's one of the great things about being Catholic is uh, for Easter and Christmas, we don't actually confine Easter and Christmas to just one day. Uh, the church celebrates those for eight whole days. If you go to Mass uh, in the week following Easter or the, the week following Christmas, we're still in solemnity mode. We're still in big celebration mode. Uh, we are still praying and celebrating together as if it were still Easter Day or Christmas Day for that entire week afterwards uh, because... They're great feasts. These are the two great feasts of the church, and they require a great feast. <laughs> uh, they require that we, we celebrate big, and so the church extends those for an entire week. So keeping the octaves, reminding ourselves that for that whole week afterwards, we're still celebrating that great mystery, that great event. Uh, you know, that, that can be an important way for us to continue to celebrate the liturgical year. Uh, Lent, I think, tends to be easy for a lot of folks that, for whatever reason, that penitential season, uh, people seem to enter into that pretty well and know about prayer and almsgiving and fasting uh, because those are have still strong requirements for the church. But even in ordinary time, you know, reminding ourselves that uh, this is the season in which we, we celebrate Christ and his teachings and the, the coming of the Holy Spirit and, and try to live that out in our lives. You know, reminding ourselves what seasons we're in uh, can be really, really important. Now, I want to make a distinction real quick and just point out some distinctions between liturgical prayer and devotions, because uh, sometimes that can be confusing for people uh, when we talk about liturgy, what exactly is liturgy and what isn't, uh, because liturgy uh, is very, very set in terms of always having some sort of official ritual text that it comes out of, uh, as opposed to a devotion, which often has local or cultural variations. There's no official text. So, for instance, there's no official text on how to pray the rosary. Uh, it's, it's a devotion. It's not a liturgy. And so oftentimes, you know, depending on where you go, often geographically, uh, different people will pray the different rosary in slightly different ways, uh, whether they include things like the Fatima prayer or uh, prayers for the, the Pope and his intentions at the end. You know, there's slight variations on all of that. Uh, someone mentioned the scriptural rosary earlier. Uh, that's another example of a, a variation of the rosary. Uh, but it's not set in stone. There's, there's no one way to do it. Uh, Stations of the Cross is another good example of a devotion. There is no set official way to do the Stations of the Cross. And so we see there's a wide variety of booklets out there that will have different ways to pray the, the Stations of the Cross. Uh, the liturgy is required for the people of God. Uh, you know, uh, as we saw earlier from the Second Vatican Council, uh, that it's a right and a duty of the Christian people to participate in liturgical celebrations. Whereas devotions are optional, uh, obviously highly encouraged, uh, and the Church has never stopped promoting uh, various devotions and encouraging people to find devotions that speak to them. Uh, but there's, you know, we don't require the Rosary. We don't require Stations of the Cross. Those aren't. Uh, you know, they're not things we have to participate in, although they are certainly very good for us. Uh, 
Uh, the liturgy is self-sufficient. It, it stands on its own. Whereas devotions are always extensions of the liturgical life. Uh, it doesn't replace uh, our participation in the liturgy or the importance of liturgy, but should always draw us towards it. Uh, the, the catechism talks about uh, devotions always being tied to the liturgical seasons and always seeking to draw us closer into them. Uh, and so, again, examples of liturgy are things like the Mass, the Liturgy of the Hours, Benediction, the Rite of Marriage. Any kind of sacramental celebration is always a liturgy, uh, even things like confession. You know, there's a, a set pattern and set prayers that go with all of those different uh, sacramental celebrations. Devotions would be things like veneration of relics, pilgrimages, processions, stations of the cross, rosary. So those things which, again, uh, don't have any set uh, prayers to them don't have a set pattern to them or a set ritual to them, uh, which allows us then some creativity to play around with them. Uh, someone mentioned Visio Divina earlier, you know, a variation on Lexio Divina. Uh, I've even experimented a bit with uh, what I kind of tongue-in-cheek call Media Divina, where uh, we might read a piece of scripture, but then watch a video that uh, portrays that particular scripture story, and then maybe listen to a piece of music that reflects those same themes uh, as another way of engaging the senses in prayer. You know, liturgy is really the source and the summit of our Christian faith. Uh, and the church tells us, you know, our devotion shouldn't divert us from them, uh, but should tie us back into our participation in the liturgy. Uh, and like I said, should always support and invite us into further contemplation of the Paschal Mystery, which is where that liturgical year comes in so importantly when it comes to our devotional prayer. Uh, so that during Lent, we pray things like the Stations of the Cross or the Chaplet of Divine Mercy. Uh, in Advent, we use things like Advent wreaths to help us uh, with a particular type of prayer. Uh, lots of devotions tied to specific saints and feast days. Things like May crownings or Corpus Christi processions or uh, St. Joseph breads and, and blessing those breads. Uh, you know, again, should tie into what we're celebrating in the particular liturgical season or the particular feast day that we're on. So uh, the final piece I want to talk about tonight is why then uh, do we talk about liturgy and prayer as this engine of discipleship? What does that mean? Well, what it means is that good liturgy and good prayer requires, as the Second Vatican Council said, full conscious and active participation uh, of the faithful. These were really some of the watchwords of the Second Vatican Council, uh, where, uh, it, again, at the very beginning of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, the Council Fathers said that Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that fully conscious and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. You know, we're, we're called to participate in these things, uh, and they need to be active. They're, it's not just a passive reception uh, when it comes to liturgical prayer. We're not just to sit back and be spectators, but we should be engaged. We should be fully there. We should be participating uh, in a very active way. But when we use that phrase, active participation doesn't just mean activity, as if it was just about getting more people involved in liturgical ministries or uh, trying to be busy during the Mass doing something. Uh, there's a wonderful line uh, from then Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, le later Pope Benedict XVI, uh, in his book, The Spirit of the Liturgy. He says that true liturgical education cannot consist in learning and experimenting with external activities. Instead, one must be led toward the essential axio, the essential action that makes the liturgy what it is, toward the transforming power of God, who wants through what happens in the liturgy to transform us and the world. You know, that's part of what liturgical prayer is about. It's about transforming us. By participating in that Paschal ministry, we are changed. You know, when we entered into Christ's death and resurrection and baptism, we were fundamentally changed. And that change isn't just a one-time event, but every time we enter into liturgical prayer, every time we enter into that Paschal mystery, we are going to continue to be transformed as we are continuing to conform ourselves and, and trying to lead ourselves uh, towards that perfect image of discipleship in Jesus Christ and, and patterning our life after his example. And so questions we should be reflecting on any time we participate in a liturgical celebration. You know, how is my participation in the Paschal Mystery leading me closer to God through this liturgy? And in turn, how then is God calling me to transform the world for the sake of his kingdom? 
you know, again, and part of it goes back to what we talked about in our very first webinar, uh, that, that quote by St. Athanasius, God became man so that man might become God. Not meaning that we're going to literally become uh, another person of the Trinity, but that we can enter into God's divine life. Uh, that we can have access to grace, that we can have access to that saving power of God. And the liturgy, and especially the sacraments, uh, are one way in which we can form our minds and our actions and our lives uh, to Christ. Uh, it's about practicing for what we're going to be doing for eternity. Uh, and we have to practice it. We have to get better at it because we are fallen human beings and we don't get it right. Uh, there's a wonderful line by Dorothy Day in her autobiography, The Long Loneliness, uh, where she talks about ritual and the importance of ritual. She says, ritual, how could we do without it? Though it may seem to be gibberish and irreverence, though the Mass is offered up in such haste that the sacred sentence, hoc est copus meum, was abbreviated into hocus pocus and has come down into our language meaning trickery, nevertheless there is a sureness and a conviction there. And just as the husband may embrace his wife casually as he leaves for work in the morning and kiss her absent-mindingly in his comings and goings, still that kiss on occasion turns to rapture, a burning fire of tenderness and love. And with this to stay her, she demands the ritual of affection shown. We have too little ritual in our lives. What she means here is that, yes, we don't do it perfectly, and sometimes we go to Mass and... We don't feel like we're getting anything out of it. Sometimes we go to Mass and it just seems like we're going through the motions. Uh, but we go through the motions. We practice them. We continue to do them. Because every once in a while, we get a little glimpse into what it really is that we're celebrating. We get a little glimpse behind the scenes, that, as it were, and see the divine action taking place. Uh, and, and those moments when that happens, those are graced moments. They are gifts from God uh, to see that when we're participating in the liturgy, that we're connected to all the angels and saints and, and their eternal praise of God in heaven. Uh, again, we're practicing for what we hopefully will be doing in eternity, uh, which is another wonderful little insight from, from Cardinal Ratzinger in his book, The Spirit of the Liturgy. He actually likens the liturgy to play, uh, because play is done for its own sake, and it's done just to get better at it. And the liturgy is very similar. We do the liturgy just for its own sake, not necessarily for what we're going to get out of it. When we get something out of it, uh, we should be thankful for that. But we do it because it's what Christians do. We do it because it helps us to get better at conforming our lives um, to the life of Christ. So prayer and participation in the liturgical life of the church, it sustains us. It reinvigorates us. It prepares us for our mission into the world, uh, which is what we hear at the end of every Mass. Uh, those, those wonderful, and we have a number of different options now at the end of Mass, for what that sending is like. Uh, go forth, the Mass is ended. You know, go out into the world now. Another says, go and announce the Gospel of the Lord. You know, go out from this place and share with others what you've heard. Uh, go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Go out and be witnesses for Christ in the world. Uh, and finally, go in peace. You know, leave this place and be peacemakers in the world. Uh, this is what we're challenged to do at the end of every Mass. Uh, you know, we're not called to just stay in the church, but to go out into the world. And so liturgy prepares us to do that. It gives us the tools. It gives us the experience and the means of actually doing the mission of the church, uh, to go out into the world, to make disciples of all nations, to care for the sick, and to clothe the those who are naked, and to visit those in prison, uh, to do the works of mercy. You know, that's why we, we do liturgy. That's why we pray, is to be reminded of what we're called to do in the world, and then to be given the grace and the energy uh, and the impetus to actually go out and make that a reality. So with that, um, we've got plenty of time for a little bit of Q&A or comments uh, this evening. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can feel free now to open up your GoToMeeting control panel and type those into the question box, and uh, we can see if anyone has any uh, responses to any of this tonight. Again, I also apologize. I know some folks have had some uh, problems with the audio tonight. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, we'll see how the recording comes out, and if I have to re-record a, a bit of this so people can go back and listen to it, uh, I'll try to do that. 
While I wait and see if anyone's got any questions, I'll remind you that next week we'll be talking about vocation and mission uh, in the life of a disciple. Uh, now that we kind of have a sense of what we're called to do, how do we go out and do it? Uh, what does it mean to be called to a particular vocation? Uh, what does it mean to participate in the mission of the church? Uh, that will be our topic for next week. Well, I'm not seeing any questions come in, so uh, we will end with a, a short prayer this evening. And because we talked a bit about personal prayer and devotion, uh, maybe just a, a simple Hail Mary to end our time together tonight. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all again for being here tonight. I uh, look forward to seeing you all next week for our final session in Building a Better Disciple. Uh, look forward to it. God bless you all, and good night.